and would be asking for a Rule 10 in order to uh, make that happen. So I'd like to turn the presentation over to Bob at this point. Right, uh, hard copy. Hello, everybody. Thank you for uh, having me. Um, we said the company is Computerized Facility Integration, and what we do for a living is really help uh, large organizations put in place technology to better manage their real estate facilities. So not unlike the city of Southfield, uh, a lot of large organizations have multiple properties. When you get to the Fortune 500, those types of companies, millions and hundreds of millions of square feet across the globe. So we put in place technology and, and offer consulting to help them reduce that cost to reduce their occupancy cost. And with the top economy in the last several years, uh, we're seeing quite a bit of growth. Um, what we do specifically is really uh, three things. We do consulting to help them figure out where the cost savings opportunities are. Uh, that's really everything geared around their real estate and facilities portfolio. And it might have to do with their maintenance operations, their lease management, their uh, operations and maintenance, their construction project management, uh, ground keeping, condition assessment, there's a variety of things we do there. Then we implement technology to automate processes. So much like any other computer autom automation, we put in place systems to help them do it better, faster, cheaper. Uh, and then the last thing we do is as an outsource firm, we'll take care of the technology for them on an ongoing basis. Um, what we do it for is some of the largest organizations in the world. Uh, we've done this type of work now for over a billion and a half square feet of client facilities. Um, we started doing primarily Fortune 500 for most of the company's history, and in the last uh, handful of years, we've expanded into uh, state and local government, hospitals, uh, higher education, uh, and just uh, recently uh, federal business as well. Um, so we really, the key is that they have a lot of square footage, a lot of property. As a company, we really pride ourselves on the type of company it is as well. So we are adding uh, very high paying jobs. We, as you can see, this is some recent awards we've won for the type of place it is to work in terms of the best company to work for and, and uh, rich employee benefits and things like that. Uh, we have a very high average salary, uh, which helps them write kind of jobs in. And our staff tends to move up financially very quickly because we train them quite a bit. So they tend to uh, start, uh, we have one uh, gentleman who started with us, I think, two years ago and his salary is up about 45, 50% in the last two years. So it's the, the people who are willing to learn and, and get trained tend to advance very quickly uh, in our company. Um, so that's kind of some background. Uh, we're in the IBM building. Uh, since the company was founded, we've actually been in Southfield. Our first office building ever, ever was on uh, 10 Mile in Southfield. Mm -hmm. uh, then we moved to, um, I think it's called the Century Plaza mm -hmm. on Southfield. We lived there for a bunch of years. And the last seven or eight years, we've been in the IBM building. Uh, we just expanded our space about, uh, I think it was six months ago. We took on an additional 3,000 square feet, and we're forecasting running out of that space within another six or eight months. So we're in discussions with the building about expanding to the uh, seventh floor, which is the following presentation. Um, the building is, we're, we haven't signed anything with the building yet, but we're in discussions, and it looks like they're going to agree to what we want, which is that the building is mostly vacant, as you're probably aware. Um, we're going to move into the uh, seventh floor, uh, occupy it as if we had the whole floor and just section off part of it and then as we grow in global we'll pay rent as we grow into it because uh, right now we're in a bunch of choppy different suites. So that's what we're talking to building about. Um, yeah, um, so many of us have received emails about the, the hundred million dollars that the state has. Um, the state reprogrammed <coughs> their mega assistance program we've given matching to other companies that have received assistance from the MEDC in the past. So they reformulated how they um, pass out their money now. And so Bob's company showed that there was a big gap in terms of staying here in Michigan or going to another location out of Michigan. And so they were able to tap into this gap money. And so that's what this $100 million is. And so they're going to get a small slice of it. And so we're, we're here to support them with our local support. Um, and the request, so over the, the term of the, the request, we've got significant capital investments and significant human capital investments as well, and that's really where the gap comes in, is there's just a uh, lack of qualified resources for the kind of uh, jobs we need, so we have to invest heavily in training uh, these people. So we have a, uh, some of the gap was made up by the, the other place we were considering putting this office was Las Vegas, where the software that we implement is headquartered. So there's a lot more talented resources there who already know the product 
and all of the training is there. So I've got to fly people all over Las Vegas and house them there for three or four weeks to get them trained. Um, so that was where a lot of the gap came up with. Um, uh, yeah, uh, just to go over, so the state um, determined that that extra financing to keep them in Michigan would equal $434,500 or about $5,500 per person. So this company is going to have to show that they are hiring the people before they receive the allocation from the MEDC, and then the MEDC will be tracking those jobs. Mm -hmm. So. And we don't get anything until we have the position, until the net growth uh, position. Right. Yeah, um, shall I, can you just use the mic? Oh, I'm sorry, I was trying to. Yeah. Well, you can pull, you can pull <coughs> the podium sure. over if it's in the way of the. There we go, thank okay. you. Um, so any questions on that? So and again, the city is asking um, for a three-year abatement for their investment. And on the next slide, it'll show the breakdown. But uh, based on our documentation, they're going to be making a $575,000 investment in personal property over three years. So in year one, again, the investment will be $194,000, which would equate to a little bit over $4,000 in an abatement from us. And then there's the breakdown over the three-year time frame. Um, so you can see that during the years that we're going to give them an abatement, they're still going to be paying their taxes that they currently pay, which is approximately $12,500. So we will still be receiving money. The DDA will still be receiving money from this company. Uh, and then in year four, it's going to, we will be rolling those dollars back in. And so we'll be then collecting $24,000. Um, so here's our new chart that we came up with. Well, that's helpful. Yeah, so I mean, we are definitely still going to be receiving money from them. And, um, you know, we're going to get to keep this wonderful company in Southfield. It's their headquarters. These are the jobs that we've been looking for, trying to reverse that brain drain, bringing high quality jobs to the area. They, they plan on hiring 79 new employees um, during that three year time frame. Again, making over a $1.2 million investment. And they support a lot of our local companies here in <coughs> Southfield. They stay at the Western Hotel when they bring guests into town. They do business with our local law firms and, and all of our local vendors as well. They also host, uh, as I mentioned, our, our industry is really uh, constrained by lack of trained staff that can do the things. So we host training sessions endlessly. We uh, do a company-wide meeting every year in January. We fly the entire company in. Um, we've, we've got staff in about 20 states, and, and we do that at the West End. So we, we try to support the local business stuff we can. So again, this is our partnership with the state um, by, by um, agreeing to give them a the tax statement. It would be giving them 3% to the match that the state is giving. Um, we're competing against our neighbors um, and trying to keep them here in Michigan. Uh, really helping to diversify our community. And again, we're still going to be um, collecting property taxes from the, the, the owners of the IBM building and from this company in the interim that we're giving them the assistance. And then they will be working with um, our career center, um, Michigan Work, to help fill these jobs. Yeah, right now, for example, we have, I think it's 14 or 16 open positions that if I had the people I would hire today. Are they all IT? Um, probably 80% IT. And like we just hired a, rec a second recruiter, for example, uh, started last week. We just hired another person in accounting about three, four weeks ago. So it's usually 80% uh, technical staff, programmers, uh, uh, consultants, database guys, um, and then 20% the supporting staff. And with our headquarters here, the supporting staff is always here. So you can see I'm not Fred. I don't talk as much as Fred does. <laughs> so is that your own that. assessment? Do <laughs> 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 you like that? Huh? <laughs> 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 I like that stricken from the record. 
so I guess uh, I'm here to answer any questions you have about the business or what we're doing. <laughs> 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 we're all done for it. Right <laughs> 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 any questions, Council? Uh, what is your current amount of space in uh, the IBM building? Uh, these are approximate numbers, but right now we're, I believe, around uh, 8,500 square feet. Okay. So uh, we we just more than doubling. Well, yes, we're, uh, we would take over the entire floor. We'd occupy about 60% of it day one, and then uh, throw yeah. into it in stages over six months at current system. Okay. Yeah, it's really where we're going to put this development center, uh, where we're going to be uh, training these staff. It's kind of an internship program, a training center program. Yeah, I just want to say that IBM building is such a precious spot in Southfield, and it's been slowly vacated, you know, year after year after year. So, that put that much investment in an important piece of Southfield property is pretty significant. Any other questions? I, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Yeah, I don't have a, a question, but I would like to say that I think this was probably the best, and I don't know who was responsible for it, but this, this is probably the most clear and best presentation on a tax abatement and why a tax abatement should be uh, done that I've seen in a long time. Because every time one comes before us, there's always a uh, big argument about either we're not charging any taxes, we're giving away taxes. And I think this settles that. And I think it's the, we're perfecting uh, this, so yeah. we'll get there. The, uh, <laughs> yeah. That's a great slide. It is. We keep saying that 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 is what our we're spending money to make money. Right. right. Yeah. I just think that's really great. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I have a question. Just about the well, the entire floor is 17,000 or 17,500, I think. Um, so what we're doing, we just expanded from about 6,000 to 8,500 a few months ago. Yeah, so right now we're about half of the floor. Uh, but we worked the deal out with the building and we're moving to seven and taking about 60%. But then we're going to build out the space so that as we grow, we're adding staff so quickly that as we grow, we'll just continue to, okay, next month we pay a little bit more because we took another row in the, mm -hmm. another, you know, 500 square feet or 1,000 square feet. And the building is uh, verbally agreed to do it. We're just working to, you know, what's it really going to look like. So we'll be after, it'll look like we're a whole floor tenant, but we won't be paying rent for that corner until we go into it. Kind of. And we're putting substantial build out there as well. We're going to make it a nice, fast building for a floor. So we're asking, council, we're asking for, we're being asked to sign a new tax for the little tenant schedule for the I'd like to ask you a hypothetical question. Sure. You're looking to hire approximately 79 new employees. If the city would develop a model where we would have homes available at a relatively modest rate, is that something that you would encourage? If we presented a package you where the new employees could put to the home in the South Hill for uh, Absolutely, yeah. Okay. Yeah, and we're trying to get staff to relocate as part of this plan. So we're already talking to staff about relocating Michigan uh, to try and get talent in, in, the, in the town that knows this capability. To, and also just bring people from around Michigan to southeast Michigan. So I don't know what that would look like, but I just wanted to know if that yeah. would be We've actually thought about it as well. There's a uh, really nice condominium built right behind our building. Right. We've thought about buying a couple units there just to have our staff. We have people flying in all the time. I've got 10 people coming in next week. Um, in some cases, it depends on the staff, right? If it's a, there's a few kind of really specialized roles we need for uh, systems architects, and those we're willing to relocate in. Uh, about half of the jobs we're looking at adding are, are general IT professionals that will make it to specialists. I don't mean new jobs. I mean the one you transferred to the wrong people. They, I thought you said you were going to do yeah, we may be. We don't know. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. We're just we're just trying to figure out how to staff it, and we're going to be looking at all different angles to staff it. Okay, we have a motion by Mr. Sutton and a second by Mr. Sutton. Is there a 
sometimes they ask, uh, the, the petitioners are asking, what is it, there, why do you need this? And we'd like to have some something in writing in the guidelines that says specifically these are the things we need to see if there's uh, going to be an asset. Uh, let me back up just a little bit. That, uh, the Okay, the, the, the uh, page two of the, the, is the, uh, the evaluation that the staff uses, uh, and that has the uh, household income. And uh, uh, the, the, there is a, uh, a partial exemption. It's not a complete exemption. And what we do is we take their, uh, the uh, applicant's income and uh, figure out 10% of that uh, income to be what they would ought to pay in taxes, and then we back into that a uh, taxable value. But to start off, we need to have some specific guidelines that say specifically what should be included in income and what should not be in included income. So the uh, board did hammer out these particular details uh, uh, that uh, we would want to specifically say these are included and these are not. And the last item is that uh, back in 2008 and the previous years before that, there was always the, uh, a differential for senior citizens. Uh, in 2009, we amended that to make it 10% for everyone. Uh, but mm -hmm. over the years, we've noticed that, uh, there's, that the senior citizens are the ones that are hurting the most, and they, they need to have uh, so, something uh, extra, you know, to help them out. Uh, someone that's, you know, 85 years old is, is going to have a much more difficult time than someone that's, say, 25 and uh, has low income. So, so basically those are the, uh, the amendments that the Board of Review recommended that uh, be changed, and uh, we're asking that uh, the City Council approve these amendments. Do you need these tonight in the rule Yeah, right. Right. Uh, well, I'd move a rule 10. <coughs> so a motion by Mr. Seiber. Support. Supported by Mr. Sakasi. So we vote rule 10. All in favor? Aye. 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 Question, well. Well, I, I support it. Okay. Uh, approximately how many uh, homeowners do you see claiming hardship in, uh, the, in the In, in general, uh, just around uh, uh, less than 100 people. Last year there were 79 people that applied. 40 of them, about half, uh, did get some relief. And what's usually the percentage, just in general, of the taxes that are? Uh, it's kind of hard to gauge because uh, everyone's income is completely different. Uh, they, they tend to go from about uh, uh, 30 or 40 percent of their income down to 10 percent of their income. And is it spread out over the 12 months, or...? Yes, uh, the, the, they can apply once a year, yeah. Once a year. They can come back every year yeah. and apply. And they do. Okay. All right, thank you. Thank you. Well, I'll move the motion to approve of the position. We have a vote. Yeah, but we haven't... Okay, go ahead. Go ahead. I just want to make sure what all the questions are asked. Okay. Yeah, that's, I'll wait. I'll support the motion. And then, the then, then, then the discussion comes after the motion. Yeah, that's what I was waiting for. Okay. Mm -hmm. It was unanimous that we do a little time. Right. Mm -hmm. You want to wait then, Mr. Frank? Until after the motion is introduced. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I move that. Mr. Moss moved and supported by Mr. Seiber and Mr. Frank. Yeah. Um, I don't see in here uh, where it states in this written part that uh, they should provide their income tax for the last several years. I do see where they have to uh, provide. Yeah. Uh, well, that's in the state law that says that they have to provide their, uh, their right. income tax returns. Then if they have to, isn't that kind of double uh, doing, uh, bringing up? Double time or make it work double hard. 
could they do their income tax plus they have to bring in all their bank records and everything else? Well, we we have to have some some way of gauging it. If we get, have no information at all, and it's, it's very difficult to if they claim that they have no income, <coughs> we have no way way to verify a, a negative. So we need to have the uh, the IRS 1040s, the uh, bank statements, uh, whatever they have to to quantify. It. Okay, um, the other the other piece in here. Uh, tonight I was listening to the uh, uh, radio on OAN, and the state is trying to write a legislation that will uh, bar anyone that has won a lottery from collecting welfare or food stamps or anything. Uh, is that but part that, of that's that not part of that in there? Uh, it could be. But, uh, um, I don't, you know, uh, if you don't win that much in the lottery, but because it's not it's in and out, it's, but it's still part of your income for the, the year. Well, we've had some of our cases like that where, where someone ha had been working in <coughs> a factory for quite a few years and they, they got a buyout and they, they were able to pay off their house with, with that kind of uh, uh, buyout. Mm -hmm. And so the, they, they had their uh, home loan free and clear and then the following year they had no income. Hmm. And uh, I know this is sort of an odd one, but uh, do you establish uh, a blanket amount where it says, because it says routine funeral expenses, is that a blanket amount? N well, uh, that, that was added on at the council president's meeting. Uh, we, Whatever was the, the normal, we, we could ask several funeral homes what, what is the customary and, and, and the routine cost for a funeral. If someone paid uh, you know, uh, for a lavish funeral, it's, it's not That's the customary thing. routine. Yeah. yeah, what it depends, you know, it depends on what customary routine yeah. it is. Yeah. So I would imagine you'd have to come up with mm -hmm. a, a number that you plug in. Right. So, okay. so this, this, that, that particular issue came up because uh, w one gentleman had a, uh, uh, <coughs> he borrowed from his uh, 401k to pay for his wife's funeral. Mm -hmm. And we, we called it income and uh, on, on appeal he said, no, we shouldn't count that as income. <coughs> The only purpose he took it out was to pay for the funeral. Yeah. I mean, enough is enough. <laughs> okay, thanks. Okay, we have a motion to approve the revision to the poverty extension program. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? The motion has carried. Can I have a question for David? Yes, yeah, sure. Uh, one of the notices going out for the board of review. Uh, we expect them to go out this week. You're not planning on coming in, are you? No, I'm not. Okay. <laughs> he doesn't even get coming. The entire team is assembled. Um, I have, I have. Yeah, you go ahead. Sure. Um, what we have, uh, the council is uh, a, a okay. game plan for our swimming pool and sports arena locker room refurbishing. There have been discussions uh, in the past about uh, the need uh, uh, for a considerable capital investment in parks and recreation. And what we did is prioritize. Uh, we had a finance committee meeting where uh, the committee uh, met in the arena. Uh, so we were able to uh, visually uh, review all of the areas where this work uh, this project would uh, be involved, in, including uh, even the boiler room, which was uh, actually pretty uh, fascinating. Uh, uh, it gives you an appreciation for the complexity of the uh, equipment uh, and functions uh, that, that make it possible to have a swimming pool that opens on time and uh, meets standards, uh, and also uh, a nice arena uh, that functions uh, appropriately. Uh, we're pleased to report that, it's, that uh, 
people are coming in using the facility. Um, and in general, I thought the appearance uh, of the in the upkeep uh, of the arena was was good, uh, and I commend the staff uh, for that for that effort. Uh, the finance committee reviewed in detail. Uh, we're hoping that we don't know if we can quite meet the, the uh, standard of, uh, of the abatement presentation, but we think we're going to be uh, get good grades on this in plain English. Uh, and uh, we're here to uh, fully explain uh, all of the uh, items, uh, uh, elements of the capital expenditures that we're, we are uh, recommending. Uh, this will also be uh, a Rule 10 uh, request. Um, that is a, a request to declare an immediate need to act. And the reason for that is uh, that the equipment is needed uh, for the swimming pool to open uh, on time and uh, be up to the latest uh, standards for the uh, ADA. Uh, and uh, also uh, that the boiler, uh, the boiler needs to be installed and be functional as, as well. So with that, I'd like to introduce the team that's going to, to go through this uh, presentation. It will be Doug Block and Bob Murray, Ted Davis, and uh, Mr. Corey Anderson, who uh, is from the company that is the world leader in aquatic play solutions. And he's going to explain all of the uh, uh, equipment that uh, is being requested for the swimming pool. <coughs> good, evening, good evening, Madam President, Council of Guests. Uh, Jim said a lot of uh, kind of my spiel, but what I'd like to do is pass out some of these uh, highlights, full, uh, full text that Corey was nice enough to bring along. If you take a look at page six and seven, I dog eared them. Everybody knows our operations guru, Bob Murray, Ted Davis uh, lives and breathes ice arena and pool. And Corey, even though both of these guys thought I was going to pronounce his name Cody, because I watched too much Disney with my girls, Corey Anderson is with Vortex, and he's our um, production the general manager for Vortex, and he can answer any questions that you might have regarding what I did, just distributed. Uh, basically, with today being Klinschke Day and the Tigers are down in Florida, you know, spring is hopefully around the corner. And now that we're talking about swimming pools, hopefully summer's not too far behind. But what I would like to do is just briefly review Exhibit A, if you could turn to that in your uh, council packet. <coughs> And what I've done here is broken down in terms of the sports arena cost analysis, um, sections A, B, and C. And this was all reviewed. Um, unfortunately, I was out ill, but uh, Bob and Ted Davis did a very nice job at the council finance meeting um, on Valentine's Day. And what I've broken down is legal compliance, must-dos. Those were things that were part of the original $271,000 fund balance draw that your body approved back on July 11th of 2011. Um, Section B are must-dos requiring new money, and that's why we're here this evening, um, to basically address dysfunctional items, some safety issues, uh, ranging from uh, arena lighting to the shower tiling, uh, different ADA compliance issues, security upgrades, uh, removal of concrete, pool animals, and then section three is what we, or C is what we've classified as our wish list or our want to do's requiring new money. And that's where, <coughs> that's where Quarry comes in. Those are what we classify as the pool toys. Uh, the Pelican, the three bells, and the climbing wall. And we can drill down into that later, and that's what's in the brochure um, that, that was just circulated. What we're looking for tonight uh, is basically your body's approval to spend a fund balance draw of $193,000 and change. Uh, we feel that it's a prudent use of our fund balance. It only represents 4.6% of our 
existing for $4.3 million uh, available fund balance in the Parks and Rec uh, account. Um, some of these uh, refurbishments will hopefully lead to a reduction in uh, repair and utility costs, and also an upgrade in the facility will help us in terms of generating hopefully incre incremental revenue um, just because it'll enhance the overall look and feel of, of the facility. We're also asking for a Rule 10, as Jim had alluded to. Uh, the pool toys, if we go in that direction, usually there's an 8 to 10 uh, week production window um, that's necessary. And again, our pool is scheduled to be open. There'll be a soft opening on June 11th and a more formal opening uh, the weekend of June 16th. I believe it is. So the, the clock is kind of ticking. So that's that's why we're asking for Rule 10. Uh, moreover, there is a limited window of opportunity between the time that the sports arena shuts down ice for the season and we you know, re reopen as a, as a pool destination to get all these other things that I mentioned: the tiling, uh, some uh, minimal tearing out of concrete. And it would be best if we just had a focused, concentrated period of time uh, with which to do that. Anyone else want to jump on? Oh, we're going to finish. You know, you got someone else uh, to speak. Basically, that, that that was my overview of those three uh, specific sections. What, what we need to do is get into the, the, the swimming pool and the swimming pool uh, items so people will understand how, what it is we're getting sure. and why. Does everybody have the exhibit A in front of them? Yeah. yeah. Okay. <coughs> we're really talking B now. Is the, the aquatics. Right. Well, section A is the hot water tank and the pool ADA accessibility. Bob's already done considerable leg work on the second item under A. Um, that would be a lift that we need to install in order to open and be compliant with the Americans with Disabilities Act. Um, section, B, and that's old money, as it's mentioned there, the 271,000, that's part of that fund balance draw from last summer. So we, we came in under, under budget. Correct. So mm -hmm. we don't need new money for that. Correct. Um, section B, again, addresses dysfunctional and safety issues. Um, We've been in consultation with both our facilities department as well as administration. Those items are listed there, uh, and they, they run the gamut from uh, re reconfigurement of the uh, shower partition, partitions, uh, restroom plumbing, arena lighting that needs to be replaced to uh, be proactive in any potential safety issues. Uh, the removal of the existing <coughs> obsolete school animals, bless you, and uh, related removal of concrete, ADA compliance issues, item number eight, um, knobs, et cetera, security upgrades um, in terms of the entire arena site, both ice and pool. And uh, you know, uh, if, if you want me to drill down on those, that's what I brought the experts along for. Um, I want uh, the full council to know that all of these items were the result uh, of the tour. So, I mean, the finance committee put their eyes to, to, to all of these. And, uh, they, they're necessary. I have a, a question on item in the uh, legal compliance. Uh, can you explain how the uh, lift or whatever it is works? Um, sure. Uh, yep. We had a picture. Shallow is the shallow end of the pool. Three and a half feet. 
Pardon me? Three and a half feet is a shallow as part of our pool. Okay, so if it's a small child that needs this, mm -hmm. wouldn't that, even the shallow end be too deep for a small child to be in, in the end of the pool? Uh, you know, when you talk ADA, I'm always thinking of zero depth. So they can only go in, as, they'll go in only as far as they sure, can they go, go in. Uh, sure. I mean, but there's no ideal. choice. I mean, we're required by the new ADA statutes to provide two handicap accessible entrances into our pool, primary and secondary. Um, technically, right now, what we have is portable ladder, a portable ladder down in, which some, with some minor modifications will be our, I guess, our secondary mm -hmm. accessible entrance into the pool. We've been using it as a primary handicap accessible entrance. Sure. Now we would have a lift, which would be our primary entrance. And for, I mean, ideally, we'd love to have a zero depth. That's just not what we have. I right understand, understand that. Um, I mean, they're always going to be guarded. So, you know, it's just like when a child would enter, an able-bodied child would enter, there's going to be someone watching them. Mm -hmm. It's still going to be guarded. Nothing changes with that. So if it is over their head, if there is an emergency, of course, there's lifeguards right there on duty at all times. So, so but isn't the piece of equipment would be attended because you cannot, you, you have to have somebody to operate. We would have to have someone always on staff in that vicinity to assist with that piece of equipment, yes. But it, it's set up that if it's an adult that needs that chair, you know, they can operate it with, with a hand control. Okay, but what, what would we do in a situation <coughs> like that? What would we do in a situation like that? With a child? Yeah. We would assist them in entering the pool and if there was an issue we would react at that point. Just like we would if an able-bodied child jumped into the pool and needed assisting, we would watch well, them jump in and then react at that point. I hear what you're saying, but it would seem to me that with this lift, and uh, I'm sure you've handled the situation before, you can only put one child at a time. It's one person. At a time. Yeah. So if there are, if there's more than one that need the ADA help or the, the lift, sure. you can only put one child in at a time. With that, yes. And then you, if yeah, but, you could, you know, but if they only have limited skill, water skills, you couldn't leave them alone to bring the second one in. I don't know how, I don't know how it works. I think you're thinking of when an individual would need individualized attention yes. in the water, which we cannot provide. I mean, obviously, we yeah. cannot be an attendant for a disabled body person, in every disabled body person that would want to be in the water. Mm -hmm. If they require individualized attention, they, it would be incumbent upon them to provide their own therapist or their own person assisting them. Does everybody know that? Yes. Outside of what we, when we envision this lift, how I envision it, I mean, having been there for years, is really I think of the half water aerobics class is going to use this more than anyone. Um, we don't have a lot of physically disabled children attending our facility. It's more of our senior citizen water aerobics class that is probably going <coughs> to be very thankful for this. Mm -hmm. um, so they don't have to, you know, go down the stairs, they'll be able to use this. That would be, I would bet, 99% of the usage for this. Okay. Well, on that section. Okay. I, I also don't understand how the climbing wall works. But, uh, okay. That's why we have all that. You're going to demonstrate it for us. I'll leave the left. <laughs> <laughs> uh, those two don't go together, unfortunately. <laughs> we get the opportunity to re-justify it. Uh, the popularity of it uh, in other areas, other 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 facilities that have one, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So uh, that's that's why we have the team here. But uh, expensive item. Oh, back back to the lift. If if we do not have the lift this year we will not be able to open um, from March 15th on. Yes. We're, we're required to have that lift or we will not be operating. We're required to have a purchase order for that thing. Yeah. <coughs> no, I don't have any problem with that. It's just that how's it going to work, you know, once we get it in, installed? I mean, you've answered that question. Yeah, there's, there, there's a, a handicap ramp uh, coming from the building and we look to place it right at right at the bottom of that. And that's also right near a lifeguard. Right next to a lifeguard tower. Yeah, yeah. Okay. so it would be a really good location. Council of Brady brings up an important point, Bill, and we talked about it in the Finance Committee, is um, we're, we're working with a 
one-year-old facility. I got that right? Mm -hmm. uh, yes, I do. Okay. It's, it's 1971 because I, I took another walk this weekend and, and took a look, uh, stopped in, and things are looking good. Um, people were in there. Uh, ice was good. People were playing, doing the hockey thing. It wasn't a game, but it was like a, some kind of practice. <coughs> and, uh, you know, it reminded me when I looked on the walls in 1971. And so while, while we need to do this to maintain our existing facilities and make the best of them, uh, this just shows the, the need for long-term planning as well. Because, uh, you know, the zero depth is, is the way things are now that in the newer you know, in the newer facilities, this is zero depth concept. Uh, but so we're, you know, we're doing the best we can sure, with, I understand. with the facilities we have. Well, we did talk about in finance that we would never build this existing pool again. If we were building a pool today, it would never, it would not be this. We wouldn't do an eight lane, 50 meter pool. Mm -hmm. Okay, now, where is the climbing wall going to be located? The climbing wall would go in the south, Sure. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. Hello, I'm Ted Davis, for those of you who don't know. Um, climbing wall would go on the south end of the dive well, opposite of the diving board. Um, and what we were looking at doing was we have two play features there for the kiddie pool, which we think are going to be very popular, which allow us to have a splash pad component without spending the same kind of money a splash pad would be, which would be three hundred to five hundred thousand dollars this is going to give us a couple of components of a splash pad for much, much cheaper. The climbing wall was an add-on that we thought would be something for the older kids utilizing the pool. And when I say older, let me say nine and up. Kids that can swim, but, you know, it's just a pool. It's not very exciting. Outside, once you jump in the diving board and go on the slide a couple of times, it's, it gets old a little bit. I mean, you know, it is what it is. We thought this would be a really nice thing to add. Um, Corey brought it to our attention, and first time I saw it, I thought it was just the coolest thing in the world. It's basically like when you go to any rec center, a lot of them now, Livonia is one where you see a climbing wall. Um, this one is great because it's a climbing wall over a pool. It arches back. So a kid is going to climb up this wall and be able to literally throw himself off of it into a swimming pool. No, you can see the picture right there. So, so sell us on this. Who, who else has one of these? Well, uh, the <coughs> Last year we installed one at uh, in the city of Lansing. It's Hunter Park Pool, and they have a four-wide, uh, four-panel tall climbing wall. And from from the day one that they opened till the, to the end, the day that they closed, it, they had a line for kids waiting to uh, to go in. So basically, um, there's they have it's four panels, so they allow two children to go from either side. They jump in the pool. There's a half half of the panel that is in the water. They grab the handholds and are able to get their feet onto the bottom pegs and climb to the top, touch the glass, and then jump back into the water. Then they swim away. The next child jumps in and it just repeats itself during the whole day. It's called exercise. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it's a nice, like, like Ted was saying, it's, it's something visual above ground else to do at the pool rather than zero injury potential. Uh, no, it needs it needs a uh, a well of water below because it gets all Yeah, I was hoping uh, <laughs> 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 that's not the part with the zero. Water, water right? is a good thing. No, no. <laughs> yeah, it, yeah. We probably want to put there's, there's uh, uh, have you had any injuries in Lansing on this thing? They're falling into water, so nothing other than, than kids. I got it. In ordinary. Belly flops. That was why it would go in the deep end. We yeah. needed for the yeah. four panel high, was it a minimum of 10 feet? Yeah, I think it's deep, yes. Okay, and we have a 12 foot, you know, deep uh, in the deep end, so it was, it was a good fit. I was just going to have to sell, Mr. Fisher. Yeah, I think. Well, the other, the other thing is I suppose this rules out the splash pad over at Beachwood. Not necessarily. No, no. Okay, because that's one of the things that was sort of promised to us. We still want to do that. Okay. Actually, we're still talking with Corey yep. uh, and, and putting the design together right now. Yeah, I'm, I actually have on my on my desk. I was working on it today. I have a layout and design. Okay. Good. Because the folks on the other side of town, uh, these are something. 
about the pelican and the three bells? The pelican about and the three about bells. About the three bells. Bring your own energy. I uh, yeah, you have to bring your own energy. Obviously, I grew up on a farm, and we had the we had to crank the well to have the bucket and mix. For, so this this works off the same concept. When when I first met yeah. with with Ted uh, at the at the pool, we were looking at you know possibly piping in, breaking up pool deck, and that's that's a big expense and a, and a big headache to to put a piece. Something like this, it just it just gets bolted onto the bottom of the of the pool floor, and it turns a wheel, and that wheel works the mechanism to raise the water from the pool out to the feature. So the one is the pelican, so the neck fills up, and after after the kids prime this prime is the kiddie pool. pool. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's the kiddie pool. So after so the kids, the ones that are there don't work. So their existing play features, no, they do not work. So they're going to be cast. They're going to be removed, mm -hmm. removed yeah. and cemented, new cement put in. So as as the kids prime, it's not it's not like you hit a button and the water comes on like a splash bag mm -hmm. that we were talking about. The kids physically have to turn the crank until the water primes, fills the pelican neck, and then dumps out on them, and continuing doing that that process. The other one is the is the three bells. I think it's right next to it on the on the catalog. Um, where this would has three arms that the water is pumped to that fill up a, a bell or a dumping bucket and then once it reaches its tipping point it turns over and, and dumps water out on the on the kids. <coughs> Mr. Davis, if these ever malfunction you're gonna have a major fire drill in your hands and the kids get used to these. They gotta work. Yeah. Yeah. That's why we're going with Vortex. This job, <laughs> Corey's going to st stop what he's doing and come right down and fix him if anything ever happens. Yeah. Next 20 years of his life. <laughs> Maybe 19. Okay. Surprise me how quickly did the, the buckets fill up? It depends on how quickly uh, they turn. To crank. But it's well, if you're talking about really small children, <laughs> sure. they're going to run out of energy if they, if they don't see some re results pretty quickly. Sure. They're going to be crying a lot. I would, <laughs> I, I, obviously, and you have, you have lifeguards because this is a yeah, this is lifeguards cool. there. Also, I think the kids there tend to, they're like, it's like they travel in a pack. Mm -hmm. So I think more than one is going to be turning this at one time. I envision, you know, three or four. It will be a team effort. Mm -hmm. um, if, 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 if a little kid cries, you're going to jump on it. I'll jump on it or <laughs> I'll have a lifeguard jump on it. <laughs> exactly. They're not, they're not going to have to worry. I mean, I have a uh, 10-year-old and 8-year-old boys and a 3-year-old daughter. If she wanted it to work, she would tell the older ones. Yeah. And they would sit there, the 10-year-old would sit there the whole day just because he's providing the, the water to be dumping down. So. <laughs> She's preparing them to get married. What? <laughs> She's preparing them <laughs> for marriage. <laughs> Superior verbal skills. <laughs>
turtle. The, yeah, the turtle on the yeah. east end, yeah. uh, east of the pool, uh, between the sports ring and the Civic Center One Ball Diamond. So we, we have some put some if things if out. If we can do that, I'd appreciate it. Yeah. The other thing is uh, under the uh, toys, uh, the climbing wall is, is thirty-six thousand dollars. How is that? How is that cost out uh, for that? Is it is that panels that are put in place in a metal frame, or how is that construction? Yeah, it's a metal frame that's constructed, and the panels are are uh, folded into that metal frame. Uh, and there's, it there's, there's, there's multiple there's multiple con configurations that are involved with it. So we can go from one one panel, two panels high, or one panel wide, two panels high. Up to, I think this one is that quote is a four by four. Four panels, yeah. <coughs> four by four and four panels tall. This is two. Four. That's two. the picture is of two. Oh, is what, we're four getting week. four? So yes, it's four, okay. so we'd have to have two people on at the same time. Okay. So you'd have, you'd see about three and a half panels above the water. Like I said, the half a panel was so below water. Well, so how is that installation, is it, how is that installation of 50,000 allocated? Because that's just for the is that just for the wall the 36. No, the 36 is just for the wall. Yeah, what we were trying to compensate for was um, not knowing exactly what's under that kiddie pool if we had to um, create some more footings under there. So we were just preparing for that. Plus, uh, those items need to be what's called bonded, or they need to be grounded um, into an existing grounding wire that goes around the pool area like all the lifeguard stands and the, the existing pool slide. So, so <coughs> the exact, you're really not exact, you're doing some right. estimated it, costs. Yeah. It could come in less than that. Yeah, or it could come in more. Uh, not no. likely. Yeah. No, no, I think we're more. pretty safe on that.
I'm not sure on that one, whether we have a designated tile uh, operation or we don't. I think we do, frankly. Somebody that comes recommended yeah. by yeah. facilities. But, uh, you know, if it's over 10000 and it hasn't been bid before, it'll be bid. Correct. Yeah, that's what I want to be sure. Normal you pay somebody you feel comfortable no, with. No, no, yeah. no, 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 no. If it's north of 10, it will be bid yeah. out. Yeah. Okay, so if you're going through the bidding yeah. process to make sure that it's exactly. given an opportunity to bid. Exactly. Okay, I wanted to make sure of that. And then uh, the pool toys, is this a sole supplier or is that going to be bid out as well? Um, the, the pool toys could be could be bid out. Um, we have uh, we have a program called uh, Direct Buy that that meets the bidding requirements. It's like a uh, a buyer's network that that the, the city would apply for, and then once they <coughs> once they are approved for for that buyer's network, they can buy off of that contract. It's like a state contract, and that could be purchased that way or could be bid out. Right. But the problem is with the pool toys of how they are with the crank, there's not another manufacturer. All right, so this is, but still, we're going to run it through purchasing. Okay. Absolutely. Okay, okay. so that'll be the next step uh, tomorrow. We'll be paying a visit to purchasing uh, so that every everyone knows that we're in compliance with all the rules that, that right. we have. To piggyback on what Corey said, correct me if I'm wrong, you're the sole, sole provider of these products in the yeah. state of Michigan. But it's understood. We'll work in conjunction <coughs> with purchasing. Okay. Uh, for example, if we have to get a, if we have to get another approval, we'll put it on the fifth March. I mean, we can get started with a lot of this. Yep. But if, this, if, if, if purchasing would say is an issue, okay, the, the we climbing wall, which is above your ten thousand dollar mark, okay. could be purchased off of GSA, which. I, I think somebody would told me that, yes, that you guys have purchased yeah. off the GSA before. Yeah. Right. Oh, that's authority. right. Th this is through the building authority. Right. So the building authority automatically goes through all the purchasing yeah. uh, procedures. So, and there's a meeting scheduled quite quick. Yeah. So mm -hmm. we'll be running this all by all, all through the building authority. Okay. So we'll get down to uh, C with the painting of the locker, so that's going to be done internally as well, and the sports arena windows, is that internally as well? That's just, that's a note, correct. That's uh, a note that our facilities department has kindly offered to step to the place they're going to deal with that internally. You're alluding to the uh, note one, the $4,635. Right. 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 So this is part of... Yeah. B or this is Actually, it's separate. It, it's separate and it's not part of the amount of money that we're asking for tonight. I just wanted to be all inclusive in terms of all the line <coughs> items that need to be addressed. At that all right, item. so painting locker room is not up under B. Correct. It's just a note and it's going to be handled internally we're letting by the facilities department. Everything we're doing to make the place look better. Absolutely. Uh, the, the, the facilities maintenance has a charge to Parks and Rec, a significant charge. Okay, and so they negotiate things like this. Uh, they actually have a, they, uh, I think it's arm wrestling. That's two out of three. Big brother, little brother relationship. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I just want to make sure that this definitely go through our process and that proper bidding is done and that there's no um, going to person would like but we, we really stay above board. <laughs> Everything is fitted out, it should be fitted out and you know pool pay pool play supplies this, but can there be another company that supplies not the same of it? To make sure that we're fair to ourselves
You still can't hear me? Like I said, I'm, I'm a little bit under the weather. I know. I'm getting enough. <laughs> That's what my wife says when I talk at home. So. Is that better? We need a microphone. Okay. Uh -huh. Okay. Um, Mr. Seiler. Um, when I read my packet on Friday, I was just want to let you all know that I'm very pleased to see this. Um, I think we all recognize our pool is tired. And I thought the idea of the toys, um, I was expecting just refurbishing. So I um, really appreciate that you bring some new excitement, something different. Uh, we need that over there. So um, I'm totally in support of this. Thank you. Uh, yeah, how many lifeguards are on duty um, at any given time? I'm I guess my, the heart of my question is, um, does the climbing wall require more lifeguard shifts, more lifeguard supervision to, to take away from everything else that's going on? No. We, we have 10 lifeguards, our full staff, one full supervisor. Um, we have eight on duty at each time. There are two down, manning first aid. We have seven stations and one walk, what we consider. We were already, uh, when I planned on doing this, we would simply move walk to a standing location right next to okay. the climbing wall. And explain about the swim test. Yeah. Also, when kids enter the pool, especially camp, uh, we, can, we test them. So everyone to, en to use the deep end has to be able to swim one length of the pool, or actually, excuse me, a width of the pool. Mm -hmm. um, so they have to prove their swimming ability. They get a special colored wristband because of that. So lifeguards are able to identify kids that <coughs> can swim and can't swim, and we're able to monitor who's using the equipment and keep the ones that can't off of it. So. Yeah, I was going to introduce, make a comment uh, because there's, this is to me a, a band aid over a bad situation. Um, but I would like us all to be on some kind of a, of a vision that would cut the pool in half and come up with a covered pool so people could use it year-round. And so I think that the pool would not necessarily be as big as it is now. And the pool, is, as I understand, is very big, and they would build one like that today. But, you know, when we were talking about <coughs> uses that we can use year-round, uh, that would make a real nice uh, facility. Uh, and and it, it would be competitive to what our neighbors have. But uh, anyway, you may talk about that conversation we had. Yeah, I mean, to address your concern, um, Bob and I did meet with Aquatic Source and an architect last week. Um, we have had discussions about that, again, this pool would not be built today. It's a nice pool. <laughs> it looks very nice when the water's in it. It's a 50-meter, eight-lane pool. You know, the model now is three or four on the size footprint we have. Um, we met with Aquatic Source and Architect about doing just what you said, about having a zero depth entry, um, changing the orientation of our water slide, building a wall in the middle of it where we'd have an eight lane competitive component to it, a dive well with this um, climbing wall, and then we'd have a zero depth entry where we'd be able to put some plate features and, uh, and make this a much more user friendly pool. We'd be able to multi use. You'd be able to have a general swimmer, or a swim team swimming. You'd be able to have you know, kids playing your camps there. You'd be able to do multiple things in the same pool, as opposed to now where we're pretty much stuck with offering general swim at one time, um, you know, swim lessons at a separate time. So we did meet with them. It's something we're going to look at, um, and we'll have, you know, conceptual drawings done up. But it's it's definitely there. I mean, we, we know what needs to be done. Um, it's expensive. Yeah. I mean, it's, but it's, we've all thought about it. I mean, it's, and we've also talked about doming. We've had, I don't even want to say it. We've had discussions with groups about possibly doming and utilizing that pool year round to offset our costs. Um, and, and we've listened. I mean, we're, we're out there thinking about it. So it's something we know. I just want to keep it really, you know, on, the, on our lips that we are looking at it down the road. You know, this economy may turn around and, yep. <coughs> and, Really, the real nice thing is that if 
people could use it year round. You'd have hockey on one side and swimming on the other side. You have multi use, and uh, I think that's yep. really where we should head. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, we we have a, a council school committee that is supposed to be working on shared resources. Um, the Sapo High School school is hardly used at all. It's maintained, it's and it's a year-round pool, um, um, and it's a shame. There's no swim team at Sapo High School. Um, the, the one swim team is at Lathrop. And um, it's just really underused. And it's in great shape, it's been maintained. And um, you, know, you ought to look into that. I always think it's a shame that the school doesn't open until June 11th, and then you close before Labor Day. Yeah. Which is the yeah, norm that's nowadays. A, that's a, a lot of work mm -hmm. for that mm -hmm. little window. I mean, it's, and it's, it's a great thing to have. Uh, I wouldn't want to have a city without a pool, uh, but um, you, you know, there's a facility right over here that is just not being used. Um, <coughs> it's a shame. The problem with Southfield High School pool is it's a 50 meter, it's a 50 year old pool, yeah. not ADA accessible. Yeah, I understand. Um, you know, I. I I mean, I go to newer communities all the time, and I see the joint use partnership they have. Where I was just at um, um, Wald Lake High School, and uh, they have a competitive swimming pool, and then they have literally a sliding glass door that separates out, and then they have uh, like a splash pad with a with a water slide. Um, so it's they have a community component, and they have you know their competitive school component of it. It's um uh, head of facilities uh, before I retired, and we're always looking for uh, ways to save money. I had recommended closing the Sapa High School I and mean, just draining it for the amount of use and the expense to he heat the water and the chemicals and, and all of that. Um, and it was decided not to do it, uh, but that was my recommendation. So I'm familiar with the fact that it's got its limitations, but it's also not being used. Um, so before you go build something else, you know, uh, I'd look at that. Do you have mandatory classes that have swim instruction? Well, the enrollment is down, mm -hmm. and, um, you know, there are a whole bunch of factors, and um, there are other things in the curriculum, mm -hmm. um, and there just wasn't the interest in, in um, um, floating, or no pun intended, a swim team. Uh, so um, they combined them uh, as they had to do. I just think that every child should know how to swim. Oh, I, I agree with you. Um, but um, it, it's still a great facility, and yeah, it's in good repair. Okay, I I want to say I yeah. this idea of taking the tour. I was privileged to go on the tour because uh, I only had two finance committee members, and I was the third member of the company and something like that. But that nothing nothing could compare to shower areas and some of it just, so there's just wear and tear that needs to be spruced, spruced up and that nothing can take place of seeing it for yourself. And I want to say about the school, I would love to see an indoor outdoor pool, which I think is what some people are talking about. Um, if we could do that, it would, it would give us that year-round thing. It would probably be very expensive, but it would be, instead of just replacing the whole pool, look at, look at this, you know, look, we should look at that indoor outdoor because you can use it all, all year round. Um, I, these these um, toys and the climbing wall, I thought the climbing wall was crazy to put by a pool until I saw it tilted out and I could see the logic of it. And, and it was, um, it's, it was quite interesting. It's, this, is a good, <coughs> this is a good plan. This is a good plan with minimal uh, expense. It uh, will provide some nice features for the children and make it more interesting. And, uh, I, one thing we should point out before we, under no surprises, uh, there are trees that are going to be, that need to be cut because uh, they're a maintenance uh, problem. 
maintenance nightmare, uh, and they basically are, are no, no longer functional. They drop their needles. Yeah. Gerald, P.O. Box 155, Southfield, Michigan, 48037. My telephone number is 248-352-9188. Um, I have had the opportunity to do a FOIA and get the grant application narrative as well as the FEMA article or agreement article. And our city administrator as well as members of council kept referring to the changes that the federal government made in reference to the SAFER grant and the SAFER grant stands for Staffing for Adequate Fire and Emergency Response Hiring. I read this and I don't see any changes that the government has made in this document. It says in here that changes cannot be made by the government and also by the city without written approval of FEMA. So I would like, and I know that you don't pride yourself on answering questions to residents and certainly not to certain residents, I would like for someone to just be magnanimous tonight and respond and tell me what changes are you referring to that the government threw in after the grant was approved. Now I know that um, the Southfield Sun had in there that the city of Southfield accepts FEMA grant. I want you guys to be very clear to the residents that this is not the safer grant that you've accepted. And it says here that you have from May of 2011, May 18th of 2011 to May 17th of 2013, tell the residents that the grant that you accepted was for equipment, which I said that the fire department would probably have to come back and get another grant. Be clear, it's the equipment grant and not the staffing grant. So I wanted to know, what are your plans? What are your plans about accepting the grant? Do you feel that you owe the residents an apology for using the millage and this grant together? 
you told the residents that in order to accept the grant, the millage had to pass. The millage has passed, and you still have not accepted the grant. So are you going to tell the residents that you basically just used it to market the millage? Are you going to tell them the truth that the, if the millage had not passed, that we would probably be, like Detroit, fighting to keep an emergency manager out of this city? And I can yield a little bit more time if someone wants to answer the question. Mr. Sherrod, I want you to know that I have the utmost respect for you. I think you have a very hard job, and I think that you try very, very hard to do your job. And that's just... Uh, you, you don't speak directly to staff. You address your comments to the chair. Very quick. Are you done? I'd like to continue since I only have five minutes, please. That's the kind of loyalty that I was basically referring to, that the fire department gave up very huge concessions to make it easy for the city to accept the SAFER grant. And I think that <coughs> the city in return owes the fire department your, your loyalty to them and your due diligence to accept this grant and stop wasting time. And I hope that the updates are going to be very specific. Are we accepting the grant? Is it going to be for six firefighters? Is it going to be for five? Because there was conflicting stories. You said one thing in the minutes in, in January of 2010, and then you said something else to me throughout these council meetings when I've asked about this grant. So I really want you guys to be very specific. And I'm hoping that... Uh, the city administrator is not instructed by the council president not to answer the questions and not to be specific. It, it seems like it's just a normal expression that you make. No, you don't have to answer the question. So if you're not going to be answering the residents, you should basically let the people know that we don't have a transparent and open government. Thank you very much. Uh, for the chair, if I could. I'd like to provide an update. I'm looking for Fred here. Uh, for the uh, integral part of the work we've been doing. Um, on uh, President's Day at 7 a.m., we had a meeting with uh, uh, staff. Uh, we had uh, Mr. Zorn, we had uh, uh, Keith Raleigh, and Ken Wheaton, who's the grants person for the uh, fire department and the chair of the Finance Committee, uh, Councilman Percassi. And the, what we were doing is getting an understanding of the uh, SAFER, I'm going to call it SAFER 1 and SAFER 2. SAFER 2011 versus right. 2010. Right. Okay, 2010, 2011 is what um, Ms. Gerald has basically been referring to. Uh, but we wanted to look at uh, the SAFER 2 potentials as well because there's an 11-12 rendition. Okay. Uh, we eliminated that rather quickly because that would have uh, required us prior to the, uh, the implementation date to issue layoff notices or actually lay people off in the fire department, which of course is uh, absolutely something we do not want to do uh, and we do not want to participate in something uh, that might look like that uh, uh, to, to, to somehow technically qualify uh, for federal funds. Uh, we have ethical problems with that, uh, as well as in May of uh, 2011, uh, we told the public uh, that uh, in the millage uh, that this was about uh, uh, avoiding layoffs and uh, to come to turn around and, and, and issue layoff notices be totally inappropriate. So SAFER 2 is off the, but we have had a goal of getting 
the existing SAFER grant reconfigured uh, for some time now. Uh, the reason we've had that goal is as the SAFER grant was constructed, okay, it would not have been a good deal for the residents of the city because it would simply have been a dollar in and a dollar out. It would not, we would not have received any kind of help to, to sustain the existing fire department that we have. And due respect, when, the, when we first applied for the grant, there's been a lot of changes, and those changes have, have been in the general economics picture here. Those changes have, frankly, conditions have gotten worse. Uh, uh, on July 4th, we updated our financial plan, and the uh, next two years are looking uh, like a greater decline than we had originally anticipated. Uh, so we felt we had a good argument. Go back to the feder federal government and say, look, can't we work this out somehow? because uh, they, they did approve $2.02 million, but what that would have done is have given us no economic assistance whatsoever because it would have simply added personnel and under the theory that in two years you could lay them on. Well, we don't treat people that way. Our firefighters are very sophisticated. They get the best training, and we want to keep them. Okay, so, so we did want, not want to enter into a situation that doesn't fit our model of, of, of and our standards. So we, we've been in uh, negotiations on and off on this situation for, for quite a while. Uh, we met uh, and went through everything uh, because we had this deadline for, that we were looking at the safer two in, in depth. And so we went into the whole subject again. We spent two hours on it, uh, you know, quiet time. No phones ringing, uh, no, no business being conducted, uh, you know, normal, normal business. And so what we came up with is a game plan to, to recontact the authorities and say, look, this is our story, uh, and, and we have a plan. And uh, it would involve... I don't want to get into too much detail because, again, we, we don't have the full approval to do this uh, uh, from, from the federal people. Mm -hmm. But we've gotten some good vibrations this time around. And uh, Fred, maybe you can, could you were in on the phone Yeah, this morning at uh, 9 a.m., uh, myself, uh, Ken Wheaton, and Keith Riley met at uh, Fire Station 5 uh, around 10.30. We were able to speak uh, to a new, uh, we are, we have been assigned to a new, in essence, a field rep with FEMA. We had a conversation where we discussed what's happened to the city's economics since September of 2010. And we have made a proposal to them that would allow us to use part of those funds for existing personnel. Uh, it was received very favorably has been recommended that we um, write an addendum and Ken Wheaton is working on the addendum. Mr. Shret and I will be working on the fiscal uh, uh, financial piece to <coughs> the uh, program. But Mr. Faison's conversation this morning uh, was he thought that what we were proposing was reasonable. Obviously we have to go through a formal approval uh, process with uh, within FEMA. Um, that was the best reception that we've had from them. And, and I, you know, I think candidly moving from the general field rep to FEMA wants us to use this money. And that became very clear. Uh, originally when we approached them in the beginning, oh no, you have to use it the way you submitted in your grant. Today's reception was a very different reception. Um, and I think uh, we have something that can work for for us, I, I think to the, uh, you know, I, there were some statements about whether or not we changed our original plan and what was submitted uh, was, would have brought 11 new people in. Our financial situation does not support that or justify that. We can meet all of the uh, National Fire Protection Act standards as established uh, by 1710. We went through all those requirements with FEMA. I think for council and, and the general public to recognize that this is now a negotiation. With any negotiation, 
Um, there needs to be a willingness. The basic rule: you can you either, anytime. You, we know what our our principles and what it is we want. If we can't get that, then the grant simply doesn't work for us. FEMA has, been, has said they're willing to consider our proposal, and um, it was received very favorably. So that is the latest. You have said that this morning. We've been battling on this. We've been trying different, knocking on different doors. Uh, and, and we've gone the legislative route. We've talked to lobbyists. Um, yeah. um, I, I think it's real clear FEMA wants these funds used. And I think they are recognizing across the country, there are other cities in the same position, that the rules that they applied for had strings that cities just couldn't live with. The whole idea of hiring people, laying them off, that plan. Uh, first of all, there's costs involved. You have to pay the unemployment. Second of all, you know, there, there there are other other things that come into play uh, that have costs. And, and, uh, just and it's not the right thing to do. So what we're trying to do is come with a compromise where uh, we can add some limited staff. Okay, uh, we don't want to get into detail on that and build up some, some hopes in case this thing breaks down, but that's what we're fighting for. And then, but overall, there would be some monies that would help with the general budgetary problem. And that's what we've been looking for. We're not looking for one dollar in and one dollar out because that doesn't help our financial situation. We're looking for a grant that can be used a piece of it for existing, for, 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 for uh, uh, additional staff, and then, uh, and then the rest could be used just to assist with our, with our current operation. So uh, that's, that's, where we that's where we're going for. Jim, you might explain uh, to you that, that this is the... Mr. Driver wanted okay. to recognize that. Go ahead. Uh, I was just going to have Jim explain Go something. Ahead. Explain about the electronic throwout party. Things are thrown out. They have to be exact. They don't get an opportunity to discuss it with any real person. You might yeah. Go there. Well, that that's the um, when we talked about the safer too, especially. Um, <coughs> there just wasn't any, any room to, to negotiate on that. Uh, you had to play the layoff uh, uh, routine. Uh, that's that's not where we are. Not where we've been. Not where we told the public. And and. Uh, it would have had to be uh, somewhat insincere and uh, wink, wink, and, and that's just not in the, in the picture. And I, I don't even, I, I wouldn't even propose that. But so if you if you have any differential in your application, uh, it's something a little bit different. It gets kicked by a computer. Okay. With the existing grant, we're we'll be, we're well beyond that. Our application was accepted. It was accepted uh, under certain understandings that uh, uh, that might have, have uh, reflected a mindset in the color two years ago now, almost. Okay, but no longer works. Didn't it? And so we've had this goal. We've discussed it several times of trying to reconfigure this thing. It comes down to re that, that word reconfigure. And if we can get that accomplished, we will we'll be glad to we'll, uh, wholeheartedly accept the monies and, and, and utilize them exactly according to, to the plan. Basically. I'm sorry, Mr. Sadler, go ahead. Um, I have a question from Mr. Charette. Uh, is it not true that the official uh, millage uh, information never tied the safer grant to passing a bill. Absolutely yeah. true. We never tied it. And in fact we, we went out of our way not to not to have that relation and, relationship. Um having um, arranged a um, uh, a millage presentation for uh, my neighborhood, Magnolia neighborhood and North Bank Gardens, we did a joint meeting on the millage. Um, off script, the fire department uh, firemen talk about the safer grant. 
it was not part of the millage presentation. They just got up and they were in the audience and they and they talked about it. And I suspect that they did this a number of times in, with different audiences. Um, but uh, I never saw anything that came out of the Millage Committee or the City of Southfield that said, pass this and we get the safer grant. Um, and I, I just think that that needs to be restated. That, that's, that is not accurate. May I comment? No. And I have to agree with you. I was not on council during the time of the Millage. I was just a plain old resident in the city of Southfield. <laughs> and, um, you know, I never even knew about the state program until after the election. You know, the campaign season started, but never was, uh, I never heard about the state program. I, I want to say I had heard from a couple of citizens um, that there were occasions when the firemen and the policemen were partnering and going around door to door in many cases. And there were some cases where the firemen actually did tell the police <coughs> when they were knocking on the door that the, um, <coughs> the safer grant uh, was, they were promoting the safer grant and so it had to be passed in order to get the millage. And it's true, nothing that the city put out, nothing that the committee put out, nothing that the person we hired put out, nothing tied it to the safer plan. It was not part of it. But some individuals who went door to door did bring that up to some residents, not universally, but I, I had been through that myself, and I'm sure some of you did too. So it's, I think we need to get the air clear that that was never part of the knowledge campaign. Anyway, thank you. Um, yeah. I'd like to be uh, either justified or cleared up on this too. Uh, if I recall, when we authorized the fire department to write the Sabre grant, it was my understanding that we authorized them to write it for five people and said that maybe there's a way that we can get to six persons. But when the Sabre grant was written, it was written for 11 people. Mm -hmm. And which, which bowed up the, the, the negotiations with the uh, federal government because we never authorized them to write for 11 people and then they wouldn't negotiate with us. It is what it is and you got to take it. And and, uh, uh, and I agree with everything that people have said is when we went out for the <coughs> millage, it was if we don't pass the millage, then the, the threat is that we won't be able to support the number of fire and police that we have on on the uh, payroll right now. So, so anybody that gets up and says that it was tied directly to the safer grant, it was not at all. So. Yep. Yeah, I just want to add to the discussion because we've been hearing a lot about the safer grant, especially in the campaign last mm -hmm. year, and and you know I wasn't even fully uh, informed about what it was, where it stands. I think that was the clearest, concisest up-to-date information that we could have received on um, where it stands today um, and you know we keep hearing about it but I think questions have been answered in my, in my opinion and I don't want to thank Mr. Charette for kind of explaining where it is and, and what's going on with this. So Madam President, I just want to comment. Um, this is, and, and I think, you know, the grant, the, the Safer Grant 210 it was very unique. It was kind of an all or, all, all or nothing. And it really, as, as a grant, didn't meet what was happening to, to the economics. You know, and, and I think our staff needs to be commended for what, the, what they've done. And what I don't want to have happen, I think the next two, three weeks need to be focused on finding some type of compromise and move beyond this lack of loyalty to our employees type statement. Because candidly, it's the loyalty to our, our employees that has put us in the center, you know, of one of our, one of our management principles is to do everything to avoid layoffs. And, and we've kind of built that as a cornerstone of our management principles. And, and, and in a lot of ways, we're unique as a community. We're to be commended. A lot of folks would have just said, ah, you know, cut 10%, go to every department head, tell them to cut 10%, and figure it out, guys. But we've been able to stick with that principle through a, a lot of you know, the, the, the collective wisdom of this group, Mr. Charette. But I, I think the next few weeks, just have to be focused and not getting into this division and focus 
on the task because I really think yesterday's meeting and the, the conversation with FEMA really made uh, some leadway. We've had one staff person, Ken Wheat, who's done a phenomenal job in, in putting this together. We need him to be able to focus his energies in, in a positive attention. Mr. Charette and I need to focus our energies in a, to the immediate task at hand and not get caught up in, in a lot of, um, lack of better words on my part, in pettiness. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, can you go the next update is a negotiated uh, agreement on this. The next uh, person who is requested to be recognized is Mr. Gerald Mullen. Is he here? Is he yeah. No, she's uh, not, uh, not here. She's uh, not here. That was a different issue. But we we want to put her. Uh, I, I met her in the lobby, and uh, the, the council president and I talked about she, this. Really needs to be on television. Oh. It's a cancer walk, and. Um, to be Sue, Sue called her, and, and the 19th will work for her, so, so she'll be moved to the 19th. Right. Okay, thank you. All right, Mr. Mellon, your name and address for the record, please, and you have five minutes. Madam President, my name is Gerard Mullen. Since 1968, I've lived at 17880 Louise Street. Tonight, I'd like to talk about those nice folks at Dingo, a corporate friend of council, the tune of $150,000 in regards to Carpenter Lake and about Council's generous granting of tax abatements to Denzel, a scheme that allows Denzel to scan the city of Southfield out of much needed tax monies. How does this scam work? Let me explain. There are two types of tax abatements. The first type, the good type, the intended form, the proper form. And then there's the second type, the bad type, the perverted form, the Denzel form. The good type of tax abatement is a win-win situation like the presentation given to Council earlier tonight by Computerized Facilities Integration, LLC. The company wins by receiving an initial tax reduction for making a business decision that it would not otherwise make. And the city wins primarily through expansion of the tax base. And secondary, the city wins again through a domino effect due to increase of ac economic activity generated by additional capital goods. Both primary and secondary events cause a positive cash flow to the city's treasury, a win-win for both parties. It's important to note that in a good type of tax abatement, there is no direct cost to the city. That is, no de facto negative cash flow from the city's treasury to the tax abated company. Again, a win-win situation for both parties. In contrast, the second type of tax abatement, that is the bad type, the perverted dental type, is a win-lose situation. A win for Denzel, a loss for the city of Southfield. Denzel is about to receive a tax abatement for apparently no good reason. The plausible but misleading reason given is for the replacement of existing equipment, which Denzel would replace regardless of any city tax policy. Plus, and this is the important part, the new equipment doesn't add to the city's tax base. Thus, the city loses due to a reduction of tax revenue. Plus, the city receives no apparent offsetting benefit for this tax abatement consideration, or does it? Again, I refer to Carpenter Lake, a very expensive quid pro quo for this city. It should be noted that the city will receive from Denzel with this new tax abatement a, re a reduced tax income for the same value of capital goods. Consequently, this is a de facto reduction in the city's tax base, and effectively a negative cash flow from the city's treasury to Denzel. In a word, the only rational reason for a tax abatement is to expand the city's tax base, not to decrease the tax base, which is the case with Denzel, a win-lose situation. That's the scam. A big win for Denzel, a big loss for Southfield. Denzel has a history of not wanting to pay taxes. This will be Denzel's third tax abatement, an abatement piggybacked on an already existing 12-year tax abatement that runs through <coughs> 2018. To add salt to the wound, after the last abatement that was granted by council in 2006, Denzel thanks council by taking the city to tax court in 2010, and Denzel successfully got their taxes reduced even lower. But Denzel is still unhappy with his present tax consideration condition, and is asking council again for an additional perverted tax abatement. 
another win-lose tax abate abatement for the city, a win for Denzel, another additional loss for Southfield. In Denzel's tax abatement presentation to the Finance Committee on January the 27th, 2012, those nice folks at Denzel stated what a good corporate citizen Denzel had been to the city of Southfield over these many, many years. And then they listed a number of worthy causes that Denzel had donated to within the city. Well, guess what, folks? The city of Southfield is a worthy cause also. It's because of Denzel that our sports arena is in an embarrassment to the city of Southfield. It's because of Denzel that our road in front of the city of Southfield is an embarrassment to the city of Southfield. In fact, if you read the newspapers, Denzel itself is an embarrassment to the city of Southfield, period. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you. Madam President. Yeah, I, I have to respond to that because, you know, I sat quietly at the, at the meeting in the other room, but I rewatched uh, what was said last week with regards to Denzel and the tax abatement, and it just didn't sit with me right because we've done nothing with Denzel so far. It hasn't come before us. It hasn't been presented to me in any way, shape, or form. Um, so I think there was a remark about, you know, one, one hand washing with the other and, you know, the city's washing with the criminal of Denzo. He hasn't even done and made any decision. And for me as an individual council member, I can say in clear fact, no one ever said to me in the approval or disapproval of Carpenter Lake <coughs> that Denzo's tax abatement was going to have some sort of play in that, that, you know, Denzo is going to ask for tax abatement in order to, to solicit a donation. So I want to be very clear on that for everybody who can hear. Uh, we have done nothing with Denzo. It has not come before the agenda. It has not come before us. There's no presumption that we're going to approve or disapprove. And with regards to Carpenter Lake, that, that simply wasn't said, it, it, clear or muddled in any way, shape, or form. Thank you, Mr. Moss. Anyone else? All right, the next person that's Stephanie English, 28735 San Carlos. In the continuing saga of our police officers attempting to expose alleged corruption conducted by the current acting chief of police, who is over special investigations, I now accept the additional task of discrediting uh, the memo that the council president keeps reading every time I present proofs that the former chief of police, Joe Thomas, did not conduct a formal a uh, proper formal or informal investigation into the allegations of 40 plus days of time investment conducted by one of our current acting chiefs. The memo issued by the city administrator and read by our council president doesn't make the situation true. Her power to continue reading the memo does not trump logic or the truth. I'm prepared to take this challenge on to show that there is a conflict in Chief Thomas's statement. The city administrator states a full investigation was done by Chief Thomas. I have in my possession the uh, current policy and procedure of how informal and formal investigations are conducted within the department. This policy was conceptualized by Chief Thomas and authenticated by the other deputy chiefs. The policy is a binding arbitration agreement that represents the rules or the way things are supposed to be done. The processes were conceptualized by the chief which means that this is the way it has to be done to be right. The, important, the most important policy point of this policy is how incident reports are done, formal or informal. The most important point is that they have to be written. That's the rule. I have requested through the FOIA process any record or documentation which would have accompanied any type of investigation that the chief would have properly or correctly performed. The FOIA response to my request for any documentation, the letter states that no documentation exists. Therefore, Chief Thomas failed to perform to the policy that he should have followed for 40 plus days of alleged time fraud to be investigated. Again, if there is no paperwork, then the investigation did not happen per this policy or correctly per this policy. On February 13th, I uh, spoke with the city, the city attorney and I had a discussion over the phone about this matter. She stated to me that Chief Thomas gave all his DCs, I guess that means the deputy chief's comp time. I answered back to her that this is not the rule or allowed by the deputy chief of police binding arbitration contract. I was able to get a copy of this contract from our officers within the next couple of hours to present at last week's council meeting, which I gave to all the council members. 
The de uh, deputy chief policy, as you read, states that the deputy chief cannot receive comp time or credit for overtime under any circumstances. If Chief Thomas gave comp time to all his DCs, it was against the rules. I contend that sometimes leaders who are so great or think they're so great sometimes create an emperor complex. These individuals are usually gifted employees with stellar successes and credentials. They appear to be perfect at all execution, they solve all problems, and they create the image of perfection to the point that no one questions their authority or intent. This may have been the image of Chief Thomas, but the downside to the emperor employee is the potential for this individual to act above the law because no one is going to question his actions. He has positioned himself in almost an omnipotent way, so he has created a without question reverence. Blind allegiance is just what an emperor employee needs to maintain his status quo. The assertion from the police officers is that the former chief did not conduct a proper investigation into the de deputy chief's time fraud. That's more than 100 officers against one chief. No individual is owed blind allegiance based on their position, title, or power level. Chief Thomas has a stellar work history. In addition to the demands of his chief position, he taught university classes at Eastern Michigan University, earned his doctoral degree, and had his own consulting firm. Unless he's Superman, were there are enough hours in a day or a week to accomplish all of this. Maybe his spouse helped to maintain his business, or maybe it was a self-sustaining business. Doctoral education and study requirements are so rigorous, many professionals take sabbaticals from work to complete. How did this former chief manage to accomplish all of this? We contend that he may have used his position to take unauthorized time to do some of this. Who is going to question him? One remedy to get away with this would be to give your direct reports the same privilege. That way, everybody gets a piece of the AWOL pie. The current acting chief who committed the time fraud allegations may have just been acting within a culture that Chief Thomas set up and no one has questioned or reported until now. No officer would have been able to challenge or report these offenses. However, the truth is pushing his head forward. I complete that to say that last week, when I spoke and requested a meeting with Mr. Charette or any other council member uh, re pertaining to this, I had no off, uh, answer. But you gave seven extra minutes to the extra gentleman, seven extra minutes, and you had conversation with him to invite him to, you. I timed it, you gave him seven extra minutes. Dave Carruthers, you gave seven extra minutes Dave to. Dave Scarborough. Scarborough. Through the chair, um, it's difficult to sit here and, and listen to the negative comments about Chief Thomas, who uh, I worked with for a number of years, uh, and whose dedication to this city was was absolutely tremendous. Uh, I can tell you. Call him any time of the day or night, and get whatever information was was necessary, uh, or to get the reaction that was necessary in an emergency uh, situation. Uh, also, the fact that that he was chosen by the Department of State to serve the United States government to train the police in Iraq so that our, so that our troops could come home. And, and it's just, it, it's incredible to me that this rhetoric goes on. And now it's getting personal about Chief Thomas, and I've got to speak up. Uh, number one, in terms of comp time, th this term is, is totally misunderstood. Okay, there is no official comp time, but if a person, and the Chief explained this to me, he and I had numerous conversations and by the way, there is written documentation. Uh, there's, there's signed documents by the police chief of how this matter was resolved, okay, and it, it, it was reviewed in detail and in conformance with Act 78 and all the other rules that there are that, that pertain to, to, to these matters. And let's suppose a person works, say, 20 hours on a weekend. There's an emergency. The chief might give, might say it's okay to take Monday off. It was informal. Okay, all of all the all the uh, deputy chiefs were treated that way, uh, and that's just how the department operates. Uh, this is a.
salaried position. You do not get paid overtime. You do not get a accumulated comp time that can be turned in for money or that's, that's rolled up at time and a half. That's not what we're talking about. So <coughs> someone got technical on the definition of comp time to give the information that was given. So, 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 you know, Ms. English in that regard has information that's, that's technically accurate but doesn't, doesn't apply to the situation. So uh, I, that's all I have to say. Um, but uh, when, when we go to the integrity of the, chief, of the former chief of police, who is now you know, a, a Department of State uh, uh, near the top in our security network in, in, in the United States State government, the State Department. Um, I just think enough, more than enough. This is this is out of just just totally inappropriate. Uh, if any if anyone wants to contact uh, any in, any investigatory agency wants to contact chief of police or wants any information, we're more than willing to provide. Uh, the chief of police is available by telephone. Uh, I talked to him in person about this when he was when he was here uh, uh, on uh, on a leave uh, for the holidays, and um, this just should not get personal with regard to to our former chief. That's all I have to say. Madam Chair? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd like to say something too, and that is uh, the allegation was that because he was a full-time chief and running his, his business that he didn't have time to, to uh, work on his doctorate, his doctoral program, and a lot of people take a sabbatical in order to do that. But let me tell you, my wife got her doctorate. Uh, she taught full-time at a university. She was the, the department chair for much of that time, and I can guarantee you that her spouse never helped her on her doctorate. Uh, <laughs> and she was successful in getting her doctor, doctoral program. So to throw out an allegation that, well, he couldn't do that, is just as, I could almost say, as, as uh, hollow an argument as one other speaker that got up that said, because the deputy chief doesn't have a, a degree, he couldn't write that letter. Somebody else must have written a letter for him. That is so preposterous that... It just waters down everything else the person says. That if that's what you're hanging your hat on, you don't have an argument. So that's. But I want to tell you that people do get doctoral degrees, carry on full-time jobs, do the work that they're, you know, part of being a marriage and, and the whole thing. And and maybe she is superhuman, but I don't see it. <laughs> I just can't take that off the record. <laughs> I just take that yeah. for the end of the day and in the morning. Uh -huh. All right, um, we'll move on. And let me just say, I, I think we've uh, responded adequately to the comments that have been made this evening. And I think at some point in time, we've got to stop spending time on this. You know, because it does take valuable time away from what we need to be focusing on. I mean, um, we keep beating the monster, it's going to get bigger and bigger. But it's sometimes you've got to just let the chips fall where they may. And that's what I'm talking about. Because, you know, um, that's just. Will Temp 
And all in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, opposed? Motion has carried. Now we go and make another motion. Yeah, um, regular meeting. I request that we schedule a regular meeting conducted as a committee as a whole for Monday, February 27th at 6 p.m., not 7 p.m. Support. Motion by Mr. Simon, supported by Mr. Frazier. Any questions or comments? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion has carried. Madam President. I, I supported it, and, 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 I, and I totally understand, but I kind of want to engage in a little bit of a discussion um, about uh, the scheduling and the notification of different changes in the schedule, because, um, you know, we sat here almost been a month ago and our clerk presented the calendar, and then we went um, date by date, and I know that the logic behind that was it was easier to cancel a meeting than to schedule it. And, uh, you know, I understand, you know, we're elected, we have to be on call at, at, when an issue comes up, we're elected to serve, and I totally get that. Um, and that's why I supported it, and, you know, I'll be here next week. But, um, you know, the communication aspect could be a little bit smoother. Um, you know, I'm, I'm finding out, you know, Monday meetings are canceled the Friday before, that there was an added meeting at 4 p.m., and I found that out the Friday before. I found out, you know, we're adding a different meeting. I found that out, you know, just a few days ago. So it, I know these decisions aren't made at Friday at 3 p.m. when our when our packets are made. So I know you know an email would be helpful or mm -hmm. something that consistently mm -hmm. keeps us informed um, would be helpful. That could be done. In this case, it's the people coming out of town. Okay, but just yeah, and, and, and that's no, why. I, 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 you're I, suggesting. Okay, suggesting I appreciate that. Yeah, a little more advanced notice on schedule that could, that could be done. That could be done. Okay, thank you. Prior to the formal notice. Exactly. Yeah, you probably know sooner than the rest of us, but you read your package and break it. Yes, I do. <laughs> <laughs> I do. You need to get a lot of it. You talk on everyone. How do I know what's there? Well, it's, but that's true that sometimes when we have kind of a jumbled schedule of because of the way we had to change it, because we don't have our regular meeting at the end of the month as we normally do. Right. So we, we really have. It's a little hard to follow the schedule. I mean, you can't memorize the schedule. That's oh, yeah. Sure. That is for sure. Uh, and I, I agree with you. So. Uh, another topic. Um, I'm wondering, uh, I know the Finance Committee and, and are, the, are there minutes for that? That the non-Finance Committee members or the council uh, can get? We're, we're behind in our minutes when we get caught up. Um, because it seems to me a lot gets referred to the finance committee, and then um, I'm not pointing fingers or saying something, but I'd like to be informed where, where we are. Uh, so, um, for instance, uh, I'm wondering we had the citizens committee on uh, the nature preserves. Um, has the finance committee discussed that, and is there any update on it?
Mr. Mullen and others were at uh, the Finance Committee, and, and I was a little bit um, uh, angry uh, last Monday uh, with an accusation that we have a done deal here, and I think that's what uh, Mr. Moss is saying. Um, I haven't seen anything. So, you know, uh, he knows more than I do. He, he knew about the meeting date that was coming up before I knew about it. So, and, and more power to him uh, that he knows that, you know. Um, there wasn't a recommendation um, that there was just a presentation by Denzo on what you've heard um, I think since, since that time there wasn't any there was nothing that was recommended by the usually usually nothing is, comes out of the committee unless there's a recommendation not that that couldn't be improved that was anything but generally that's that's the way yeah I just would like to uh, inform our council members who weren't there and the finance committee did meet with the veterans group on the parade and in the decision at that time after listening to everybody including Dan uh, was that we just didn't have the police department made a presentation of uh, Mike Havoski made a presentation they spent in so many words they did not have enough staff to be able to to uh, control it or to lay out the blocks and everything and uh, the three votes were that we just would not could not do it at this time and so uh, I think the recommendation was to let council know with the decision of finance and I'm sorry we didn't do that well, thank you. but uh, <clears throat> but it was really and we spent a lot of time with it there was a lot of hurt feelings uh, but you know, like last year road is going to be done this year and the, the thing was from Southfield High School down to Civic Center to here we got a pavilion show going on so there's not room for them here uh, it was that kind of a situation that it just did not work at this time is that the same group that came a year ago that yeah. had been in Detroit but they yes yes, right. yes. Okay. And, and I was contacted by several members of the committee uh, looking for support, uh, I think. Um, and I didn't know what to tell them. So thank you for the update. I'm glad you brought it up that, that when you, that, that's new, new information. I mean, it's not, not too far behind the movements. I mean, that was the same meeting with the Parks and Rec stuff was discussed. So we hope we'll be clear to do that. I'd like to refer this to the finance committee. What I want is, um, you know, tonight we were talking to the CSI, and this is a potential uh, employer that's bringing 79 jobs. And I really want us to explore maybe uh, Jim McKinney. Fred or wherever you want to I take it. How we can put together a piece where... I turned to Fred. Good. Let's That's capitalize on, you know... <laughs> on it's a great idea. Yeah. So what <coughs> we do to present something to them, you know, if we can select some of the homes that are, you know, maybe foreclosure or just whatever. I don't know what it should look like. The, right. the conversation I had with them outside, some of you may have recalled on our energy block that we have 125,000 for this virtual energy office. We've actually been working with uh, Ann Arbor and Dearborn. Uh, a few conversations with Al and our DEA about them setting this up. The CFI would be ideal. I mean, this is the package that they offer, $50,000. They guarantee they'll save a million dollars. Some of you may recall that we said we're going to be focused on that ASHRAE 2030 standard, the same standard they're using. So there are some so we're trying to figure out how can we sell their services to other Southfield business property managers to reduce the cost of operating their businesses. And it may have some, uh, something we look at, at for the city as well. And we've gone through extensive energy audits. Uh, this whole campus here, we just finished one for McDowell Towers, and we've done three of the five fire stations. No, but I'm, I'm talking in terms of home. 
We could, that would be the, the next step of that. It would be working with that the homes as well. Uh, what they do in the integration, they would go to like a federal mobile and say $50,000, they'll come in and they'll guarantee that they can save you a million dollars. No, 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 no. Single family home version. No, I mean, it's the vacant homes that we have, the foreclosed homes. Oh, oh, in those homes. Sure. Yeah. You know, with I'm the department, they have, they have a big um, display yep. for the housing. And I know when um, when the Chamber of Commerce had their business expo, Diana Pedler was there, and she put out a presentation um, talking about the housing stack that we have in Southfield. And we, we did work with their office to supply them with a list of some of the larger employers. And I know that she went out around to the employers and showcased and the housing. And she routinely does that. Right. That's something that's almost done. Yes. It's a matter of NSP and, yeah, and yeah. we work with the other realtors for all homes. Okay. So. But what can we tailor specifically to them? To not be this so uh, general, but really put some some thought into, you know, you've got, you know, you've got 10 employees coming in over the next four months. These are the homes that are available. And, and we'll work up some type of incentive or something to get them occupied, which is great. We can sit down and have that conversation. I actually, I obviously, I was had a very different conversation with them out in the hall. <coughs> you know, uh, we, we're going to pursue that and we can pursue Try to get a better handle on what their corporate housing needs are. Yeah. Uh, the the property rate behind them, we've uh, done two NSP homes at the best, the best of us. One we bought so bad, mm -hmm. one we provided down payment assistance to an income family. And those were both moderate to middle income families. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Is it mandatory that we uncap a house on this purchase? <coughs> Mandatory? Yeah. The poll's away, so yeah. yeah. I mean, that you want to that we'd be yeah. running afoul of the law if we didn't. You're looking for an incentive. Yeah. If you buy this house, we'll yeah. leave the taxes yeah. for two years mm -hmm. as they are, then on cap it. Two years from now. Uh, well, you sound, that that suggestion sounds like with what Wayne County's doing through its turbo right. program, and that's an extension of the land bank. So Oakland County does not have a land bank. If Oakland County had a land bank, the notion of working with the land bank and freezing the taxes for a period of time, that is happening in Wayne County. But it's one of the part of the struggle about Oakland County not having a land bank. Southfield on its own does not have the statutory authority to establish its own land bank. That's always been the hand. What other folks have talked about is there a way we can give relief to, to families. Until Oakland County establishes a land bank, Southfield becomes part of it, and then we create a program that's accepted by the state. So uh, we, we really don't have a tool to work with Not relative to capping or uh, freezing that. I think with the drop in property values, the, the uncapping isn't so much the issue anymore because the taxable values and the, and the sure. SBVs yeah. are so close now that in prior years, sure, that would have been yeah. that would have been a real consideration, but I'm, I'm not sure as a practical. Well, I'm guessing. Yeah. I think what uh, Ms. Jordan is saying, let's go outside the box and yeah. come up yeah. with an idea. Yeah. And, and, oh, and when you start brainstorming, you throw the good ideas, the right, bad ideas, right, and, right. and, and, and then you figure out what you want to do. That yeah. model is you're not taxed the first year then they're refunding 50% of the taxes you are paying, then it goes r up to the normal taxing. And they do that for a five year period. Uh, but I always get frustrated when people start talking, you know, I'll have people, well I was in this meeting in Wayne County, until we have a land bank and they have put a program in place with the county, we don't have anything to work with. If we could get a sponsor to give us a bunch of money that we could say to the business coming in, if you'll give them a thousand dollars, we'll give you another thousand, and we'll match that thousand for somebody that wants to buy a house in The Thing is, we're interested in this is a tax base issue. This, this would help the tax base. And obviously, any of their employees who were income eligible for NSP, but we, we would pitch it. But it, I mean, they were talking. Yeah, yeah. Those wages are much higher than yeah. what we could do with NSP. But then, when you think about, you know, and I know this is 
not that we use here. But Birmingham schools right on the border, uh, you know, 13 miles, we bought or hit new or what homes for sale in that block and put those on the table. I mean, there's something to be an incentive to get people to buy here and get people to go from their schools. Yes, yeah, at Fort Hampton, I'll take care of a lot of it. That's yeah. <laughs> relations that you know when they did their real estate showcase and perhaps they have a video or something that we could share with them just so that people are aware of the beautiful houses that we have in the city because they, they might not be aware of what a you know what a nice community it is if they're coming from New York or from out of state so they have greater awareness take the thing that we give uh, for home pride I mean that thing shows the city in its nicest light that the city isn't always nice, but I mean, it, you know, with the way it's produced, it, it really highlights the city. So I can get that information. Get that down to Angel some Oliver. smaller, you know, somebody's not going to sit there for half an hour watch it, but. Yeah, no, I, just, I thought that was a great idea when you brought it up, and it was like out of the box thinking, but I, even on the converse end to it, is there any way that the city can partner with the company, or at least is there is there something like this where we can be a conduit, or at least an information outlet to existing Southfield residents who would qualify for this? Um, you know, this is kind of maybe requires an advanced degree. Sometimes that's the hardest when you're a displaced worker to find work. So I don't know if there's anything that exists right now in the city to kind of promote. These are 70-something jobs that are coming to Southfield. Mm -hmm. Highly technical, highly specific. Apply. I, I think this discussion needs a big workout, not just in residential, commercial. Mm -hmm. uh, I think, you know, if, if we need a topic or, you know, to, to kind of, you know, take a morning and I don't know, go where, in their library, uh, you know, try to get into this whole tax base situation. Uh, we need to do something. Because the tax base is, the, the tax base is the issue. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, we've had suggestions that, you know, from our from our uh, attorney on these uh, appeals, it's, it's, it's just getting gruesome out there. I mean, there just is a, a different hardening of attitudes in the business community now on these appeals. And uh, she suggested, you know, some, some office buildings have to be knocked down. I mean, we have to, there's a whole thought process that goes with that. I don't, when I first heard it, how, how would that happen? You know, new construction is what builds your tax base. Anytime you have it, it existing, you got issues. You got Prop A, WPW. I'm talking on the commercial side. So uh, I, I think we need to talk to Nimrod and the real estate folks about something, or because it, these people have a lot of movement. That's what I heard. A lot of folks coming, you know, coming And we can use them as a model. After we put something in place, then maybe we could go to the other businesses that are here. Like the, uh, what's that IT20? What's that 24? Uh, 24. Oh, Secure 24. 24. Yeah. Secure 24. I thought they were always bringing in jobs. So nice and the people in the gallery, they took all that space. Um, Jim, um, we started working um, through the Neighborhood Services Committee, and uh, the, the calendar last year with the houses on it, that South Hill's place to call home, uh, we also started um, a uh, brochure uh, that didn't get finished or wasn't funded, but most of the work was done on it. Um, marketing Southfield housing style, so we have this range of styles. I took a day with uh, Jerry Zerlinski, the photographer that Nimrod uses, and Nimrod, and we drove around and we picked uh, and photographed houses across the community, some of which ended up in the calendar, um, that just shows a variety of, of types of houses and housing that Southfield offers. And uh, I asked Nimrod, you know, where, what's the status <coughs> of the brochure? And he said, well, it, it wasn't funded and that maybe we could, you know, we could talk to you again about it. So 
Uh, I, I don't remember it not being funded. <laughs> well, <laughs> I'm going to sign what he told me. Um, um, at any rate, a lot of work went into it. There was a mock-up, um, and it could tie. It, it, we don't have to recreate something. There's already something on a computer upstairs. Uh, Michael's computer. <coughs> See where it is. Uh, yeah. Adam Presley. Uh, Shelley wants to comment on the workforce development. Uh, I think going back to Councilman Moss's comment about right. the matching the jobs. You know, this company, and we do encourage all companies that are hiring to go through our Michigan Work Department mm -hmm. and work with um, Lisa Strauss and Denise Sandy. They work directly with the businesses. So this company will work with them. Also, we do get the word out to other agencies like JBS, and they have a strong workforce program mm -hmm. to help people who are underemployed or who are looking. So you know, we will get a network out to help people that are in this area tap into those jobs. Mm -hmm. Also, um, Southfield, in conjunction with, I think, six or seven other Oakland County communities, are having a job fair, the Michigan um, Job Hub. Um, on Thursday from 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. And it is for higher skilled people that are unemployed. We have 81 companies that are there. All of their jobs are posted on the website. We have a lot of people that are currently looking. And we're really trying to reach out to friends and family, people that are out of town, to try and bring them back to Michigan and to take advantage of all these jobs that are available. So um, we have been working on it. At Oakland University, the website is, no, it's at Oakland oh, University, Oakland University. Um, they have a large facility, it's mijobhub.com is the website, it's on Thursday, the 23rd, the third day. And, and I just want to, I mean, part of the, the next challenge we're going to have is so much talent left Michigan as these jobs come back. There's going to be this mismatch or realignment that we have to go through. And then I want to just comment on the brochure. We are having a dialogue with a number of companies that develop web-based applications. I would rather put money in, in a web-based web application versus developing another brochure. I, I was laying that out there. I'm just saying there, there are a number of uh, companies based in our immediate area, Southfield and Royal Oak, that are doing this, and I know that in the next 60 days, Michigan Municipal League is going to be doing a major push for cities to develop more phone I I4 applications, and to anything you can do in a brochure to become part of an application. The point is, there are a ton of pictures, yep. well, and they're all in digital. And, and that could easily become find a home. If you look yeah. at what our library puts out on Facebook and Twitter, those could be umbrellaed under that application. And then those homes in that could all be in there and then also linked right to different realtors in town. And the, that is part of what will pay the cost of developing this is for their right to sell as their services.